Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. My name is Josh Blake. I'm the security account executive here at Doble. I've uh, been with this company a year and a half and have been in the security industry for over 18 years. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to you guys no later than Tuesday, March 30th. Uh, please feel free to interact with us, uh, ask questions along the way. Uh, we will try and get to them if we cannot. Uh, we are going to have a separate Q&A uh, session at the end. So before we get started, I want to go over uh, who we are as Doble, in case some of you are not familiar. So we are hosting a virtual technology event on Wednesday, April 21st. And this event, uh, we're offering four different industry tracks, fire and safety, professional AV and live events, higher education technology and corporate use. It's gonna be an awesome event. Highly recommend, it's free to you guys. Definitely check it out. But uh, Leah is going to leave a link for you in the chat of this webinar. Definitely register and check it out. So um, we are celebrating our 50th year this year as a company. And I'm excited to be a part of that. Uh, Doble, um, we have been around in the security division for about 30 years. Um, so that's very exciting. Uh, in our security division, uh, our main goal is to provide customized solutions that integrate together to give your employees all the tools needed to make quick, decisive decisions during crisis moments. It's kind of what we focus on the most. So we have five different uh, divisions within Doble. We have our audiovisual, uh, which are uh, presentation environments, video and web conferencing, video walls. We have our event production team that do, do live events, venue partnership, media production and equipment rentals. We have our security and fire division. Uh, we do intrusion and fire, system monitoring, access control, surveillance, video intercom and medical alert. We have our digital signage, which we do interactive wayfinding. Uh, for an example, like uh, when you're at an airport, uh, knowing which direction to go and what to do. We offer retail digital signage, room scheduling and brand awareness. And we also do public address and low voltage, your intercom and overhead paging, mass notification, uh, large venue systems, K through 12 uh, AV systems as well. So at this time, I'm gonna introduce you guys to Lensec, uh, Jeff Kellick and Michael Trask. If you wanna go ahead and take it from here, we're going to discuss uh, the Lensec solution, what they can do for you and also get into some integrations as well. Thank you, Josh. Uh, my name is Jeff Kellick. I'm the Chief Product Officer at Lensec, and I'm joined here with Michael Trask, who is our Director of Sales for North America. Michael's going to be leading the majority of our presentation here, showing you the actual product, a live implementation of Perspective VMS. Uh, one of the things that I hope that you'll take away from this demonstration is that Perspective VMS is truly a unified security platform it offers a video centric view of your security implementation system that can include your access control, intrusion detection and other security and building related devices in a browser based platform, which really allows a lot of flexibility and is highly scalable to tens of thousands of devices throughout a worldwide or regional or even singular uh, application interface. So you can really play around with it a lot Without much further ado, I'm going to let Michael kind of run with that a little bit. I will also say that Lensec has been around, Josh mentioned 50 years. I, I just want to say congratulations. That is a tremendous feat for Doble. Um, very few businesses make it that way. And I think that speaks to the stability uh, that you're getting with a partner like Doble. And we are certainly proud to be a partner of theirs. We have been around since 1998. So we're just over 20 years old. We're a young pup compared to Doble. Uh, but we're happy to be here too. And, and again, I'll turn it over to Michael now to, to walk through the software. 
Thank you, Jeff. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, uh, my name is Michael Trask. I'm the Director of Sales for North America with Lensex. So uh, once again, we're uh, pleased to be here with Doble uh, to discuss a unified security platform. What exactly is a unified security platform? How does that uh, help you uh, with your business or your organization? So I'm going to uh, go through and kind of take a little bit of time here this afternoon to show our software. And as we show the software, we'll show the different pieces uh, of the integrations from these other systems, bringing those together to unify the system. So I'm going to start today. I'm on, I'm on uh, first thing I want to mention. So Perspective VMS is our flagship uh, product. I'm at demo.lensec.com. Uh, the reason I point that out is I just opened up my browser, went to demo.lensec.com, and then I signed in with my user credentials and password, um, user and password credentials, so that uh, that is uh, our system is built completely written and it's written completely in HTML5. So I show you that I, I actually am residing in a home office in Pittsburgh. Our corporate headquarters is in Houston, Texas. Because we make this demo.lensec.com available as our uh, address, I can get to that system and then my credentials allow me to get in securely to that system. Uh, but with HTML5 quickly, then that doesn't mean it has to be wide open to the internet if you're in a, for, if you want to keep it closed on your local area network. The advantage we have here is we're taking advantage of an application that already exists on everyone's computer or tablet or workstation. And that's an internet browser. Uh, doesn't mean once again that you have to make that internet, you know, you know that you're making that system wide open to the the World Wide Web. It just means you're using an application that already exists on people's computers. So when you install our software and you want to do upgrades to the software, you don't have to worry about touching everyone's computers. You update the software at that server, and people use that application that already resides on everyone's computers and tablets and phones and and whatnot to be able to access the system. You could be going across the local area network if it's closed off. You could be going across a wide area network if you, like I am now, I'm connecting back to our office in the Houston location. But, um, you know, we want this to be a simple and intuitive uh, software. We take a lot of pride in that. So the tab architecture that people are used to having when you have multiple tabs open on your computer, that's what we have. So when I take this full screen, you're gonna see we have all of our modules across the top here. So I would just click these uh, open, no different than if I had my, you know, maybe ESPN.com and I had my Salesforce open. And then maybe I had my, um, I also had, um, you know, my webmail open. So we just click back and forth. That's what people are used to. So I want this to be very easy and intuitive. People be able to adopt to this, um, the software very quickly. It's a user permission-based system. You will see uh, up here, I'm signed in as Michael Trask. My permissions, uh, I have full permission, so I see every single module that's available. Uh, if someone else in the organization, let's say, doesn't have any, has uh, no administration rights, maybe they have no rights to see any reports, those modules completely disappear. Everything else recenters on the page. This tab up here, this tab up here, both disappear. So you only see what you have permission to do. Um, so that's a nice feature. And everything, as you see, I'm signed in as Michael Trask. Every single action that I do today is logged in our, our access log query. So anything that anyone throughout your organization does, you're going to know via the access log what they've done. Maybe they've changed a feature in something or changed a setting, and now something's not, you know, now maybe you need to go back and look at that log to see what they changed so you can you know change it back to the appropriate uh, place where it needs to be uh, as well as just knowing what people are doing in the system uh, so without further ado i'm going to go ahead and jump into what is our maps module so i'll just click here and it'll bring us into our maps module so uh, as this is pulling up you'll notice uh, we've got uh, this is a map of our first floor office in houston texas uh, so uh, we've got the map and you'll notice a bunch of icons on here. So I can go over and hover over this and you'll see there's the uh, live view of our front office coming in from the uh, building lobby into our office. Once again, everyone's used to dragging and dropping things. I just drag and drop that down below and it goes into what we call our camera dock. So I'm going to go ahead and grab another 
uh, camera here. And these are live views. And you know they're live views because you either in the header, you see the green arrow there, or you would see the green arrow here as well. So that tells you you are watching a live video. It's not archived, it's, it's, it's live. So those are some things you're going to first see uh, on here. Obviously, the camera, it's, it's a video management software, so we need to have video uh, on here. But where you're going to see your first integration into a unified security platform, you'll also see other icons over here. And these other icons are access control doors. So uh, when you have uh, access control doors and you're integrating, uh, we're not just taking transactional logs from the access control system. What we're actually doing is we have the ability um, to unlock, lock, pulse those doors based on the integration we have with uh, uh, access control companies. So unlock, lock, pulse is the equivalent of somebody uh, presenting their credential or their badge at that reader. Uh, so I can look at, there's another door here, same thing. But once again, everything's permission-based. So this on this particular door, which I'm highlighting now in our back office area, you see a lot more options come up on that because the permissions that were assigned to me uh, allow me to do a lot more on this particular door than maybe what I have to do over on these doors. So um, that's the first place where you're going to see the you know integrating the the uh, access control and being able to do a lot more items. I can also, uh, you know, I can view that camera down here and then I would be able to unlock that door. If Jeff Kellick happened to be in our Houston office and he buzzed me or sent me a text saying, hey, Michael, I forgot my badge, can you let me in? I can do that right here from Pittsburgh. I could pulse that door and that's gonna pulse, uh, that's gonna let him in. It's temporarily gonna unlock that door. You may notice that two windows popped up over here. These are what we call our workflows. We'll get into that a little bit later today, but once again, it's um, some things that are you know, taking standard operating procedures and automating that process. So we're able to see these cameras over here. I, when Jeff came in the door, they automatically pop up because he had presented his badge there, or in this case, I pulsed the door, but it would happen the same both ways. And then I'd be able to view him and make sure that was the, you know, the right person without having to leave this screen. It's just gonna pop up for me and give me a quick view to see that. So uh, where else can uh, the access control kind of um, help you uh, and quickly make those, uh, as Josh uh, said earlier, those quick decisive decisions during crisis moments. You know, that's, that's a, also what we're trying to do is deliver uh, intelligent information with speed and accuracy so that those decisions can be made because in security seconds matter. So, um, but over here, you'll see the, um, what we call our actions and our events panel. So in the events panel, we have door events. So when I'm looking at these, these different events, I can qu quickly look and, and see the last 10 items here, or I can open up our side uh, panel. And you notice I've acknowledged the latest one, so it went back to a blue color. So that tells me there's not an event here under the doors that I haven't uh, acknowledged. But I'm gonna go ahead and open this side door panel. And when I open that side panel, this is what a lot of people might be used to uh, when you see an access control integration. It's taking the, um, the events from the access control platform and it's bringing them in so you can sort that information. You have the associated video. Uh, you can sort any of this uh, or filter any of this information however you want. If you're searching for particular activity based on uh, access uh, points within your uh, facility, you can do that. You can filter based on the type of events that are coming in from the access control system, whether it's four store entry or valid access, invalid access, whatever some of those different um, items may be. Uh, access control uh, card, um, you know, expired, those types of things. Uh, you can sort and search for those things. You can also obviously use your date and time pickers and you can sort by individual people's names or individual card numbers if that's all you had was a card number and you needed to filter that. But once you have that information, you know, you can play the video up here in the, in the, in the uh, upper corner over here, or you can, if you wanted to maybe make that um, a, a, you know, look at that in our archive um, module, you can click this button here. 
view and archive. So I want to show another feature within the software. Uh, it's going to pull up this camera, and then I'm going to go ahead and play. This is that transaction that we had just started with over in the uh, access control uh, log, right? So we, we looked, we saw that Mark was coming into the building. So we saw that information, but maybe now I want to say, all right, within this camera, you know, it is March. So you will see this looks kind of like a March Madness bracket. This is a great feature that helps uh, with people. And once again, the unified platform, we started from the access control system, looked at that log, saw that someone came in and, but this is from earlier in today's date. And now I hit this, what we call our view neighboring camera or view neighboring button. So with just hitting one click of a button, now I have all of the cameras that are associated with uh, closest in proximity to this lobby camera. So when, when you come in to this, uh, our lobby in Houston, and you walk past our reception desk, you're going to come through this door. And then, you know, you're either going to be viewed on this hallway camera or this camera, which is that same hallway. This is at the end of the hallway. There's a little seating area. And then there's also a break room. So if I play this through, and what you're going to be able to see is you're going to then be able to continue to track somebody through the building. Uh, you know, Mark's eventually going to present his badge at that other door, and then he's going to you're going to see him come through that other door because these it's grabbing the video uh, in the same time in the archives from uh, mm -hmm. from these items. So uh, you'll you'll see that uh, happen here in a minute. Uh, but then you also you'll notice those those uh, cameras. So you'll see Mark come through here and then he goes to the right side. If I wanted to then hit the view neighboring here, I can hit the view neighboring on that camera. Oops, I hit the wrong button, my apologies. Uh, I hit the uh, camera uh, administration button. My apologies for doing that, I'll go back to that. But I would have been able to hit that view neighboring camera and it would have pulled up those other, other views of those um, cameras in the, uh, in the archives. So, um, so it comes back to that and I would have been able to then follow that, continue to follow that person through. This feature works not just in archives, but obviously right now I'm viewing this in live view. So if I was going to hit the view neighboring camera on one of these other cameras, then it takes me to the other view that is associated. So you can follow a, you know, a person through your facility uh, or if there's something suspicious maybe going on, you can, you can do that as well. Uh, so that's a uh, that's a nice feature. Once again, it's built into our software, and it's it starts from uh, that that little example I gave you started from using the integration with the access control platform. So two disparate systems. You have the access control that normally people are used to running and having to have open on their their uh, on their one of their computer monitors and being able to do all of that that transactional stuff in that system but then also having their video management software on the other, on one of the other screens, we're pulling all of that into one and giving you that ability to do it all from one interface, but then giving you the power of the, you know, all of the other automated features for you to be able to, um, to quickly make decisions when you need to make those in, in crisis modes, or just to be able to know what is going on within your facility at any given time. So I'm going to go ahead and show you a couple other uh, quick features um, that we also have. So I'm, I'm viewing this, uh, once again, these two cameras live. You'll notice one of our license plate recognition uh, alerts popped up with a car leaving in the bottom right corner there. Um, once again, an automated workflow procedure that's set up uh, and can easily, a lot of these features, the workflows are if this, then that logic. So if something happens, what is the trigger event that happens? And when that trigger event happens, uh, what do you want the system to do? Uh, so in these cases that we've shown with the access control logs, the trigger is someone presenting their badge at the reader or someone pulsing the door uh, remotely. And then those, those, it pops up those views of those cameras for you to verify what's going on. Um, but something else that I wanted to touch base here in the uh, when you're looking at live view and helping a lot of times people need to go back and look at video or after the fact kind of find out what happened during an investigation. So we have some other really cool features um, that I can show you here. I'm going to hit this button here and we have a box our uh, 
motion area. I'm just going to go ahead and maybe say, hey, this coffee coffee maker and, and this uh, sink here, I'm going to select medium sensitivity. And then I go ahead and hit this, this back button. So what's going to happen is this is going to quickly go back and it's going to start searching that area and finding uh, results uh, if when there was motion within that area. So you saw these pop up. So I'm now quickly going through and I can then just start grabbing these videos, pulling them over and hit play and start watching. There's, there's uh, uh, one of our employees, Mark, who was in that area, but you'll notice here, there's all, it can, it'll continue to go back through the archives and find this information until you either hit stop or if you don't hit stop, it's gonna keep going until it gets to the end of a archive video that you have saved within your system. So that's a nice uh, feature. That feature is called Fast Find feature. It's a great way to quickly go back uh, when you, you have incidents. That I started directly from Live View. Uh, we were in the Live View of that camera and I started that. You can also use that Fast Find feature when you're in our archive module. Uh, when you're in our archive module, so I'll just switch over and we'll bring these two cameras into archives. I'll take a minute to to show you uh, the some of the features within within archives as well. So uh, if by default those are the two cameras I had selected, so brought those cameras in. Um, we have the uh, archive module down here. Once again, I can use that fast find uh, by you know clicking this box, circling an area, and going back. Um, but what we have here in the archive module. I've got my, by default, my, uh, I always start on the current day and I start my timeline at 6 a.m. I've got a six hour interval over here. You can make this as small as one minute. You can make it as large as 30 days. What those two uh, selections uh, create for you is the timeline here at the bottom. So over here is 6 a.m. over here on the far left, over here on the right, is six hours later at 12 noon. So, and this is the motion on these particular cameras that have been uh, captured during that particular time. And these are those items here that you're seeing. I can grab those. And hey Michael, while you're, while you're showing that, let me just give a little anecdotal example of, of this kind of forensic view of these archives. Um, for a lot of our customers, archives are a primary area where they're looking at what event happened. And Michael will demonstrate going through and, and kind of scanning through different types of views. Uh, and it's about finding information quickly. Uh, Fast Find is a great tool to find that when you're looking for motion. Of course, using those events, uh, we should not neglect that you can bring video analytics into this as well to be able to quickly find different, uh, different points in time. But it's not just about that one event, it's what happened before, what happened after to build that entire case. And you know, we've been around for a long time. We have a lot of customers, a lot of different examples that played out to help us develop this solution uh, more cohesively for those needs of forensic searching. One of the examples that comes to mind is there was an assault on a campus uh, in which Perspective VMS was deployed. And during that time, they used those features of Fast Find and that archive navigation to find the event. They found the suspect. They were able to, to extract that. And, and you can extract that video in a non-proprietary format and give that to the police, give that to the prosecuting attorney, et cetera. They gave it to the prosecuting attorney and the attorney said, this is great. I, I like what you've done here uh, to the officer that was in charge in getting and retrieving that video data. Um, but she said, we may need to prove that this wasn't a one-time assault, that this particular suspect has a pattern of behavior. So she asked the officer very nicely, would you mind, uh, I don't know that we'll need to look at it now. We just may need it in court in a little while. So can you just save the video for me? And he said, of course, the, the video is saved. Once it's extracted, it's never deleted. It'll always be saved. And she said, no, no, no. I mean, can you save all the video from all your cameras for the past couple of weeks. And he looked kind of deer in the headlights look and said, how long? She said, well, this case, it could take you know months to years to adjudicate. So just keep that for me, would you? And uh, you know, he looked at us and he said, hey, I need a fast way. They had 176 cameras on their environment. And he said, I need a fast way in which to protect this video data from being overwritten. So what Michael's showing on the screen right now is a feature we created called Archive Lock. And just by creating 
clicking an archive lock, Michael can select the day and date parameter. So he can go back a couple of weeks and select that data. And what he's going to end up doing by this selection period is saying, I want to protect that video data. Um, I want to protect that video. Michael, I think you're going back to a period of time that, that maybe it's already been overwritten. I think you're going back a month too far. Um, if you could just do like the past couple of weeks, there's an example, yep. yeah. Um, so what he's doing is he's selecting the date parameter that he wants to, to protect. Now, remember storage isn't finite, right? So, so archives will overwrite, but this method of protecting that data will ensure that it doesn't overwrite for the camera or cameras you select. And so in this case, Michael pulled off all of the cameras or he could subsort by, you know, cameras named a certain thing if he wanted to, you know, all the cameras uh, named BP and bring those over. And, and now he's just very quickly selected all the ones at the Briar Park campus. And then as soon as he hits save, what you're going to see here is the system is now saying, hey, these are off limits. You cannot delete these cameras. But more importantly, it's going to tell you right there on the right there that that webinar save took 4.33 terabytes worth of data. So now that's 4.33 terabytes of space that will not be used for anything else. But that's good information for folks like Doble because now Doble can say, hey, we could simply add in another six terabyte drive that will accommodate for that space that you are now protecting. And the way Perspective works, you can add that anywhere on the network and it will go ahead and it will find that data. So this was a real quick solution to a real life problem that they had in wanting to protect that data. Now, once that case was over, and again, this was a real world case, and it literally did take them about five years to finish that adjudication of that case and run through all the appeals, et cetera. The prosecuting attorney finally came back and said, now you can delete that data. And once they just do that right there, again, with permissions, with permissions, now that data will be deleted from the system and that space can be reutilized. But it's a great example of how, if you feel you're running up against your time window to do your investigation, and, and maybe your time is set for 14 days or 30 days before it expires, and you're investigating something on day 30 and you don't want it to automatically delete before you get time to make that extraction, you can go ahead and protect it for that period of time that you need to look and do your further investigation. So. While, while all of these great features are, are fun for live viewing, it is that investigative mode that really allows you to provide that evidence that you need. And then one last thing I'll mention on that extraction, when that extraction goes out, I said it's in a non-proprietary format, it is watermarked. So you can, you, can prove to, uh, you can prove to the court that it hasn't been tampered with if necessary, but it's also playable on any workstation. You do not have to have Perspective VMS or access to Perspective VMS to play that extraction back. So a lot of times our customers, even though it's browser based, they'll have it on a private network. We even have deployments that are in SCIFs in government facilities. So you can't access those from the outside. So they make that extraction and now that extraction can be played, heck on something as old as a Windows 95 machine at the courthouse if they really wanted to. Um, so that's, that's some of the investigative tools that you have with that. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Um... Something you mentioned too about analytics and some other things we didn't, uh, you know, because we're talking about either server side analytics or even bringing in analytics from from cameras or from third party uh, software integrations, being able to to be able to even do more. Once again, within the bringing it all into one platform, I'm going to open up this behaviors uh, tab over here as well, and you'll see we've got license plate recognition things that are that will come up in here. So there's a there's a an exit gate here that is uh, pulling up and it's you'll it's hard to see there but you'll see there's a green um, uh, rectangle around that license plate but then it pulls up that license plate and then uh, so you can quickly sort on that if you want if you wanted to find every time that that particular car came in and out of that area that's all in there plus we have other reports there's a license plate uh, report that's a nice format that we can show you here later uh, we also got the uh, uh, you know, the, the, the face mask detection analytics as well that you can look if people aren't wearing their face masks and you can be alerted to those types of things and emails can be sent out on those. Uh, that's also where that, um, you know, if you, you are alerted because we still are dealing with uh, COVID unfortunately, if, if your organization, and these are tools that are, you know, most of these tools are in here, the face mask detections and other analytic that would be added uh, to the platform uh, for your deployment. But if you get that alert that someone has a face mask uncovered uh, or 
you you find out after the fact you can you can immediately kind of track that person using that uh, view neighboring to kind of see where they go so you can get somebody over there to intercede and say hey we need you to put your mask on or more in that evidentiary you know reviewing process if you get an alert that somebody is um, has tested positive that's an employee of your location for covid and now you maybe want to go back to the access control logs, sort on that person, see every time they came in and out, use that view neighboring to kind of track where they trace, where they went, maybe who they came in contact with. So you can quickly using the video evidence say, oh, well, Mark came in, uh, you know, on Tuesday after he came in, he immediately walked into this room, sat down, have, was having a conversation with Jeff. So you're now need to get out, you know, and maybe, maybe. You know, when you're doing the question and answering as far as contact tracing, maybe they forget every little thing that they've done. But that feature using the view neighboring allows you to kind of track those that person as well for that current situation that everyone seems to be dealing with uh, as we work our way through this process. Um, but I wanted to touch base on the the you know the edge-based analytics that are coming in from camera. So access control. Uh, Dobo offers uh, multiple solutions as far as access control that they resell and we work and, and integrate with those access control partners. Uh, the camera lines that, that Dobo is uh, providing as well, we, we're camera agnostic, we work with all of those camera uh, manufacturers as well. So it does give you a lot, of, um, a lot of flexibility by bringing in those different solutions in the uh, uh, intrusion detection as well. Um, one other item, uh, kind of wanted to, to show you as well is uh, bringing a unified security platform is using a fleet application. So uh, if there's anyone on this uh, meeting today that uh, maybe is a school district or you're a business and you have, you know, you have uh, fleets that you uh, monitor and operate. Uh, once again, instead of having a separate platform that is running your fleet application, we've, we've introduced a, a fleet platform module within our solution. So you can pull, you can be monitoring your mobile assets, your fleet in conjunction with your fixed assets that you have, the fixed cameras that are mounted in and around your buildings and your facilities and all using the same uh, interface using the same controls, you're seeing the similar controls here. So it's, people don't have to learn two separate systems. They can pull it all in. It's all archived within the same, you know, system and being able to build those stories and kind of, you know, in this example, this is a school. So, I mean, how powerful would, is it to say to your, your, um, your students, families that we're able to track your, your child from the minute we pick them up at the bus stop until the, you know, they're at school, we're able to kind of keep an eye on them, make sure that they're safe, but then all the way until we drop them off at the bus stop at the end of the day. So they have that ability to kind of go back and say, look, you know, we, we've got you covered from point A to B and back to, to your home. So that's a nice, uh, nice thing as well when it comes to the integration um, with bringing in a uh, fleet application as well. Um, Jeff, do you want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the power of uh, workflows and some of the reports? Yeah, absolutely. So Michael mentioned it a little bit earlier with workflows are a great way for you to leverage uh, automation uh, within your system. And the way that we set up workflows, again, it's administrative type function to set these things up, but they're designed so that you can elicit automatic responses. So for example, and uh, I'll take, uh, I'll take uh, kind of control here, the screen a little bit. Um, in the workflow section, you can use certain triggers within your system. Michael alluded to a couple of those things that can be triggers. Those triggers could be from an analytic event. They could be from an access control door. They could be based on a login when somebody logs in. I've known security operators that when their boss logs into the system, they're alerted to it, right? The same with when their boss comes into the building. Uh, another thing that can be done even at a specific time, you'll see that workflows can be used to generate reports. They can be used to change certain things, change certain events. So there are some things that are time-based. Uh, we have a, an integrator partner that needs to deliver reports to a city because they have a city budget meeting every month. And so they deliver status reports to that city two hours before that budget meeting. 
Uh, and they do that using a workflow so that it's automatically sent out so it's never forgotten about. Some of the actions that can occur, not only that email notification that I just alluded to, you can also have a pop-up stream and you can see the pop-up stream in effect right now as we had somebody come in uh, to that facility right now on, on that screen. You can also change the entire user interface. Uh, and Michael mentioned it early on, one of our goals with this design is to make sure that we can maximize uh, when an event happens, that you are saving those critical seconds. And one of those critical second components is changing the user interface. If we get a door forced open, if we get a duress alert that happens at the receptionist's desk, you want that security operations center to light up and look at that desk immediately. You don't want a, a security operator fumbling around, forgetting what camera it was that, that the, uh, the, the receptionist or the, the office entry was looking at, right? You want it to immediately jump there. So you can do that right from here by changing for a particular user or set of users that you're setting them to and navigating to a specific user interface. So if we wanted to navigate to the camera viewer and pull up those cameras, you can design that to automate. It's much easier to set up your SOPs when you're calm and collected rather than trying to respond to something in the fervor or the heat of the moment, you end up losing some of that critical data. So this was one of our major, uh, major driving points behind that design of workflows. A couple other things that you can do that I'll just mention here briefly, uh, and we talked about more in a full training class, but changing the archive configuration. Uh, video management is about managing your recorded data. So if you have an event that happens, a critical event, you may want to up that frame rate on your recording. Maybe you know in, in normal circumstances, you're recording at seven to 10 frames a second, but a critical event happens, you want to capture everything. Maybe you bump it up to 30 frames a second so you get that full data for that event. And that can also be done automated through workflows. You can even fire device actions. We have a couple things over here on this side panel. These are called action buttons. And you can use custom action buttons to fire different things. So if we want an action button to pop up a, a, a component that integrates with the subsystem, you can do that as well. So workflows are really, really important. Uh, you can define those triggers and actions based on certain conditions. Uh, you have a history report of that. And speaking of that history report of those workflow actions, uh, as Michael alluded to, I'll just touch on reports here real briefly. Uh, in the reports module, and I say module, and I, and I kind of allude to this again. Notice we went from the actual operating viewing into administration, now into kind of an analysis report without leaving the application. It's all self-contained within this application. That's what we talk about flexibility and scalability. You don't have to train people to use different applications. You give them permissions to those items, and now they see those items in that same user interface. One of, the, uh, one of the things that we really like to look at and understand is the health of a system. I mentioned a video management system is important, is important to manage the archive video. Well, we have to have cameras that are operational to be able to record video. And here on our demo test system, we have certain cameras that we take offline. This is great for this demonstration because we can show you what that looks like. When a camera goes offline, it's not recording anymore. And not only do we show this in a report, but it's also alerted to our friends over at Doble and to your system administrators so that you can react on it before a situation happens. Nothing worse than that feeling in the pit of your stomach where they say, hey, we had an incident happen over here on the South Lawn. And you think, is that camera up? Did we record it? Are there archives there? You will know that ahead of time. If that camera goes offline, you'll know so that you can fix that before that incident happens. Another report that I like to show uh, is the archive status report. And the archive status report allows you to see all of the data from all of your cameras that you have access to. And so not only just the camera definition information, but if there are any missing dates in archives and if there's any archives that have been locked like we showed before. It even shows, and this is great for the technicians to understand what is the storage utilization per camera? You're going to see it varies greatly here on our example, right? And some of our cameras that have low resolution or aren't recording all the time, they have very minimal footprint. But other cameras will take up a significant amount more data. 
And this is all available for you to run analysis, analysis reports on. So when adding more cameras or when identifying which parts of your system consume the most resources, it's at your fingertips and easy to see. So these are a couple of the great reports that we like. Uh, uh, there are a series of reports here. I, I, I know that one of the ones that becomes very popular is the camera snapshot report. And I know that, uh, I know there are several examples of it. I know we're kind of running on time here, uh, but Michael, I know you have a quick story about a, about a officer that was able to use this to save what about an hour of his time every day? Yes, we had um, between two different reports, we had, um, an officer that was responsible at a, at a community college coming in every morning and they had to verify that the cameras were online and then they had to verify that the cameras uh, were not, uh, that the view hadn't been changed. Someone didn't, you know, uh, someone didn't, you know, mess with that camera or change the view. So they individually were opening each camera and connecting to each camera to determine, hey, is it online? And is it uh, also, um, is the view still accurate? Well, that took them about an hour to an hour and a half every single morning to go through that process. So in a matter of using our system and literally looking at two reports, the camera snapshot report, which now tells that person, yes, I can quickly look at this, see the view, see if a camera's in it. You know, if you're not getting any data available, that also is telling you right then and there that that camera's offline. But we also have the camera status report, which Jeff showed previously, that he just pulls that report up. And he, actually, because of a workflow that's set up, his, his particular uh, shift started at 7 a.m. every morning. So we set it up that at 6.45 every morning, an email was generated of that camera status report, and it was sent to his inbox. So when he showed up and sat down at his desk, he didn't even have to come into Perspective VMS to open the report. He already had the report emailed to him and he could review it and he could see that uh, any of the cameras that were offline. He could also have the report automatically emailed to him every, every morning uh, for the camera um, snapshot report. And he would be able to, he was able to go through that, those reports in a matter of minutes instead of a, taking an hour and a half. So as you can imagine, I'm sure that officer uh, was thrilled to have that hour and a half back of time every morning and to be able to get the same uh, type of information uh, uncovered in a matter of minutes instead of, um, you know, an hour and a half of time. Yeah, and that's, it's just that easy. You can see how I added it up there um, real quickly to send that report to myself. Uh, that is, uh, it's a great tool uh, to be able to do these types of things for, uh, for your users. Uh, you know, whether it's, you know, you're the system administrator, you're the operator, to be able to set these up for your users to have this. And again, save them time is a big purpose of that automation. So the reports and the automation kind of go hand in hand for that. Hey, Jeff, I, I, I forgot to mention this previously, and I don't, I can't believe I forgot it, but it is, does happen to be your favorite feature in the system. Speaking of saving time, can you just quickly touch base on global search? Uh, global search is my favorite feature. It's so simple. Uh, but yet it just, it just makes life a lot easier. So if I just wanted to look at the, you know, at the front entrance here and I didn't remember what camera number it was, I didn't even remember how to get into camera viewer. I can just use that global search to quickly just start typing. And there I typed in front, it brings up a list of everything that has that word front in it. And immediately I can go through and I can see that, uh, that particular uh, front view camera. So um, I had, a, I had a, an item up here, which I, which I did earlier, um, from a dash cam, and I just type in dash cam. I, lose my, I lost my mouse there, I think. All right, there you go. So yeah, I can just bring in that information and immediately I've got to that tag information to where I can get to that, uh, to that result. So global search is just a very fun feature. Uh, makes life a lot easier. Um, makes life a lot easier for your users. And, and when we talk about training, the folks at Doble are going to train your users how to use the system. Um, but this global search just makes life a whole lot easier uh, when they when they are just learning the system and even afterwards. I mean, I, I've been with this working with this system since we released it in 2011. Since we designed it in 2009, I use global search every day. Uh, it's just a, yeah. it's a fun thing to use. 
Yeah, the nice thing, Jeff, and just to further clarify on global search, I talked about previously how it's a user permission-based system. It uses SQL Server database as the back end to run all of this. So this is searching your SQL Server database, but the results that are coming back uh, only are the results that you have permissions to see. So uh, if I was, if I didn't have permissions to see these dash cam um, uh, items that are in here, and I typed in dash, they're not going to come back as results for me. Or if I'm not allowed to look at archives because my permissions don't allow me to look at archives and I search on a particular camera, it may bring that camera back up, but any of those archives that are related to that camera are not going to be shown in the results that I, I have for the global search results. So just another way how your permissions also work within the uh, system to, um, so that people aren't getting access to things that they shouldn't have access to. I think uh, we're about at uh, about 11.45, 11.47, somewhere around there, Josh. I want to make sure we leave enough time for any questions and answers that people may have about what we've shown so far today. Let me stop sharing my screen. Yeah, we had about three questions, guys. Uh, the first one was, how often should we be updating our systems? Well, I'll jump in first with that part. Um, we recommend, uh, usually quarterly, I would recommend that we up, update systems. And that, that might include a bunch of different things. And I'll let Lensac talk about their portion after, but um, you have software, uh, you know, a lot, all kinds of different security uh, problems, vulnerabilities that come up that it's important to keep up to date uh, to keep that under control. Um, you have new features that are released as well. But you also have testing. You know, we do battery tests. We do all kinds of service contracts uh, that we can do uh, fire testing, um, cleaning cameras, making sure you have the best view. So there's all kinds of things we can do where we can either set up a quarterly, a biannually, or sometimes even annually, uh, you know, inspections that we can come in and do this for you guys. Um, but Lentech, do you want to touch on your software releases and how often you guys do that? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll mention our, our release schedule. One of the things that I, I, I don't know if we mentioned it at the beginning, but from a software mindset, we're, we're an agile company. And, and we do that because we learn so much from, from our partners like Doble. We learn from our end users. And so we're constantly evolving the software. And our mindset is that our evolution, the, the features that we develop for customers are applicable to everybody. So when a customer uh, creates a, a request for a new feature, we say that, hey, somebody else is gonna be able to use that. So we incorporate that into the next release. We try and release major or minor versions of the software every quarter, that's our goal. Uh, sometimes we have maintenance release or uh, uh, EBFs that kind of fit in that cycle too. But our goal is to have about once a quarter, which fits perfectly in line with what Josh said for your goal. And, and sometimes, and we provide release notes, sometimes our customers say, yeah, I, I don't want to change that system right now. I don't want to update it. Um, but we will tell you that it is our advice to do so because it gives you not only the latest and greatest features, but also those vulnerability enhancements, if there are any, to work with the latest operating systems and the latest changes to your browser's environments, um, if it's in, a, if it's in a, a kind of an open system. So that's the way we look at it. But again, it's really driven by feedback. So it's not just a one-way thing where we're telling Doble, hey, we've got a new release and Doble tells you, Doble wants your feedback and we want the feedback from you too, so that we can make that product more responsive, more automated, uh, and more uh, in line with what you need to, to solve your problems. Yeah, and Jeff, that also goes to those integrations, right? We talk about uh, you know unifying the security platform. So um, the uh, voice of the customer uh, is very important. You know, if they have some other platform that they would like to unify, then we want to we want to hear about that because we want to look at integrating. Uh, those systems as well to make your life easier. I, I, I got one other, uh, just real quick question. Yeah. It, it said about the how long between your updates. Um, just to clarify, we try and do it quarterly. So that's you know about three months in between updates uh, for our software standpoint. Um, and you don't ever need to go, if you decide we're releasing 4.4 .4 as our next release, uh, the previous release of that was 4.3.1 and 4.3 before that, if you're sitting on 3.5, 
you can automatically upgrade to 4.4. So even if you skip a few cycles, you can immediately upgrade to the latest. So if you determine that, hey, we're gonna go on an annual policy or a biannual policy, you can skip updates. You don't have to go through each one. Uh, but again, from the software standpoint, our aim is to make new software updates available once every three to four months. Yeah, um, I saw another question that um, what happens, you know, what is it, what would it look like to upgrade from maybe you have an existing system that's not prospective EMS? You know, what would, what would be involved maybe uh, in, in to upgrade to prospective EMS? And so, um, you know, Josh can speak to what Doble would do if, uh, if they, you wanted them to come out and what they do at the, at the front end. And then I can speak to uh, a little bit about what would necessarily be involved based on that initial assessment uh, that Josh will might speak, speak to. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a common thing that happens is, you know, most, most places that we work with already have an existing system. So what we can do is whether you have existing analog or IP cameras, the fact is Lensac can take any of them over. Uh, that's, that's what partnering with an OnVIF company does. And even more than OnVIF, they, they really try to integrate in with everything that, you know, that's willing to work with them. Yeah, so just, I'm sorry, go ahead. So uh, all we would do really is bring in, you know, an encoder if you had analog cameras, uh, could bring in an encoder and that would tie in all your existing cameras into the LensX system. Very easy to do. Um, I mean, we really, depending on the amount of cameras you have, could be a one or two day process to get your whole facility uh, transitioned over to LensX. Um, you know, even existing servers, depending on the age, uh, we could take over existing servers as well uh, with that as well. Michael, you want to add yeah, to I that? Yeah, I think that's a key point that you just mentioned. Uh, a lot of times people might think, oh, if I'm going to upgrade my system, uh, I, I now I may have just invested money in uh, new cameras or a new server two years ago or whatever. And maybe that was a big chunk of money because there was a lot involved to do that. Well, changing it over to our system doesn't mean that you necessarily have to forgo the investments you've already made. If those cameras are already working, they're working perfectly fine. They're within their normal life cycle of of you know a camera or in for that you know another example the the server maybe you just invested in two years ago doesn't mean you you can't repurpose those and a lot of occasions when we're taking over existing systems and upgrading to prospective EMS you can reallocate that server you know and that's our system will run on that exact same server you can use those already purchased IP cameras if your budget doesn't allow for you to upgrade those analog cameras right now that shouldn't be a reason for you not to consider, you know, getting a, a system that's more efficient and effective for you. Because as Josh said, we can bring those in now just by adding an analog encoder. So you'll still, you'll have a mix of both of those types of cameras. You'll be taking advantage of the power of perspective VMS as we've shown uh, throughout this, uh, this webinar today. And then when your budget allows or as those analog cameras die and you're forced to replace them, you, you can kind of by piecemeal kind of bring those back in by changing those uh, uh, on, based on budgetary uh, allowances or necessity, uh, bring those in one by one uh, when, when the budget allows. So it offers a lot of flexibility and it's a, as Jeff, uh, as Jeff and, and I have uh, spoken to and, and Josh did as well, uh, it's a very simple process. Uh, we can uh, we can make that transition in a in a matter of depending on the size, you know, it could be uh, part of a day or a day, day and a half uh, process. All right. Was there another question, Leah? Nope. You all hit on all three of them. There, wait. There's one more. Sit. Hold on. Is there any integration with alarm monitoring monitoring software, like for instance, Manit Manitor? Uh, I'll, I'll speak to that. Um, Manitor is not one that we have yet, but that's a great point um, about what happens when we have um, when we have new requests to come in for integrations. So that feeds into us and that fits into that release cycle that we talked about. One of the key drivers of those future releases is those integrations Michael mentioned. So we do do integrate with a couple of alarm panel systems. 
uh, Bosch, there's some work being done with the DMP systems, the other systems that are out there, legacy systems that you may have. Um, yes, we'll integrate and bring those in. The other component is that we like to ask right up front. So if Manitou is one of the ones that you're looking at, what is it that you want to achieve with that, right? Do you want when that alert comes in for that zone, that that then automates that change in the archive configuration? That that sends an email with a snapshot. I didn't mention this before, but you can also get a snapshot of what that event is for video verification, as well as a link to the live video so you can play it back on your mobile device. So those things are very important with that alarm integration for that video verification piece to see if it's a false alarm, to see if there's something that's happened with a faulty sensor and be able to respond to it. All right, well, thanks to Lensec for joining us. Um, we appreciate you guys as a partner and uh, thanks to all the intent attendees as well for joining. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Uh, we have our emails here on the screen um, you know, for you to reach out to us at. And uh, thanks again. Appreciate it.